Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And I think Prague is a very appropriate place for that talk. I'll come back to this. Apologies. The title is a little bit misleading because the current state of fundamental physics, I'm not going to discuss the present because I believe that we are hardwired, our brains are too much focused on the present, too much on the irrelevant details of everyday life. That holds also true not only in science, I think also in politics. And uh, I think if you really want to discuss the state of physics, we need to have a look at history. And history, I believe, gives you quite a clear picture what the relevant developments in physics are. And I'm going to argue that there is a pattern that you uh, observe in history many, many times. And scientific revolutions are characterized by a visionary idea, a mathematical formalism, which uh, produces a, an equation, a revolutionizing equation. And at the very end, this revolution leads to the elimination of free parameters or constants of nature. So, uh, there is a simple measure of progress in fundamental physics, simplicity. And simplicity means elimination of free parameters or fundamental constants. I don't think this is idea of simplicity is a fancy idea of mine. I think we have historical evidence that good means, good physics means simplicity. It's not beauty, it's not anything else. It's a very technical definition of data reduction. The less free parameters we have, the more we have understood. And it's our job as theoretical physicists to understand the data. Now, what, is, what do I mean a constant of nature in a very general sense? Every observation, every quantitative measurement is, uh, could be called a constant of nature. Of course, it's sometimes called just a measuring value. It's sometimes called a free parameter, which is fitted to the data. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's uh, called a constant of nature. Of course, there are more important constants and less important. But just let's, let's agree on that technical definition. And uh, once we find relating equations, we are able to reduce the number of independent constants. And, uh, well, the revolution, the first revolution started right here in Prague. Johannes Kepler discovered his famous laws and actually what he did out of this incredible mess of medieval astronomy with lots of, as you know, lots of of uh, free parameters of unjustified numbers invented to fix this uh, uh, geocentric model, he said, no, it's just an ellipse. And it, an ellipse has very few parameters, just two here. He, he was able to reduce these numbers with, of course, his second law of motion. A planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And this is, again, an enormous data reduction and of course there is his, also his third or harmonic law that states the cubes of the uh, major axis is related to the square of the, of the orbital period. However, yet there are still a lot of numbers here because there are lots of numbers because we have different plans. Of course, people could not uh, go there at the time and measure the local gravity, but you still have a lot of different numbers of local gravity and this is another revolution, of course. Newton, with his uh, law of gravitation, discovered that there is a relation. It's just dependent on the mass, the size of the planet. And eventually, we arrived here. We eliminated local gravity on Earth. And of course, if we could have measured it, we would have eliminated all local gravity on Mars and Venus and so on. And we have just one new constant, okay? Lot, lots of irrelevant numbers are condensed in this important constant of nature. That means progress, that means a big revolution in physics. Well, I'm not going all, through all history, I, I'm just 
showing you some key examples. And a, oh, 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 that was, I don't know what happened. Is that the battery going wrong? So I spoiled the entire talk. <laughs> Sorry. You want to leave now? You should have a coffee break. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are. Sorry. You are not so far. I, I go to the what I call the Johannes Kepler of atomic physics. It's Johann Jakob Balver. He liked discovering mathematical laws in the spectral lines, and I think it's an incredible achievement in 1885 to be able to to find out of this variety of measurements. Okay, in our definition, it's all constants of nature, all these measuring values of spectral lines, and he discovered mathematical relations. And all these numbers become suddenly just one number, the Rydberg constant. Okay? I think that's a fantastic, of course, a fantastic revolution. And in terms of data reduction, you know, that's what we call progress. So, uh, of course, we have different steps in atomic physics. And uh, Niels Bohr uh, uh, kicked off the second big revolution because he explained the uh, Rydberg constant by other. Sorry, again, I'm too fast. Now. Just kick. Okay. Okay. So, I should I should mention the uh, the visionary idea here. Okay. Uh, Planck had just discovered the the uh, the constant H, and Einstein had uh, given its important meaning. Uh, uh, as light quanta, but the visionary idea was, oh, this new constant could act as an angular momentum in atomic physics. And this led to another important reduction of, of uh, natural constants, because the Rydberg constant is now explained by other constants of nature. You might say, okay, it's just one constant explained the weight, but a very important one. So this is a huge progress of quantum mechanics. I'm just giving you a other examples, uh, Planck's uh, law of radiation. Why is it important? Before there was Wien's law and there was uh, rayleigh jeans law with two different free parameters. He said, no, there is just one free parameter, it's H. Again, one constant less. We have also other uh, revolutions. Maybe this is one of the, my, my favorite example, the visionary idea. Uh, light is an electromagnetic wave. And guess what this idea has done to modern civilization? And the key element, of course you need, you need the mathematical frameworks of, um, of uh, Maxwell's equation, but uh, the key equation that reduces the number of contents is just the electric and the magnetic constants, wow, it's related to one over c squared. And, uh, by the way, this is also this was this was discovered by Weber and by uh, Kohlrausch also, and, and they looked at the coincidences. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer that at the end. Um, and this is what is also often dismissed as just doing numerology. No, numerology has often <coughs> often led to very significant progress in physics because. We just had a formula, a coincidence, and later it was justified by a mathematical theory. And I think that's one of the most prominent examples here. And, uh, well, you might say, what, what's, what's, the, what's, the, um, uh, what's the constants which were eliminated by, by special relativity? There were uh, E equals mc squared eliminates a lot of constants which were not even discovered. Why do I mean this? I mean, if you do nuclear physics, okay, you need this equation E equals c squared for any, any nucleus, okay, for any nuclear reaction because it calculates the energy. All this would have been new parameters, new unexplained, uh, poorly understood numbers if there wasn't the explanation with E equals c squared. And you have also another a uh, visionary idea uh, by uh, the German physician uh, Meyer, who said, oh, temperature is just kinetic energy. And you say, this was, uh, you could call this, this uh, a constant of nature, 
And why do, don't people call it uh, today again? Because it has become a definition of temperature. But in this very uh, simplification, uh, we find the progress done by Maya and by uh, Boltzmann and by Joule. Uh, there is one constant less, we have explained it away. Now it's just a defini definition of, of temperature. So, let's look at physics. And I have collected uh, the fundamental constants around 1930, and I uh, said, okay, we have the mass of the universe and the radius of the universe, even if they were measured at the end of the 30s, and even if uh, particle physics had produced some extra numbers. But this is, let's say, the state of maximu maximum simplicity that we had achieved in 1930. And, of course, we have uh, Newton's constant g, we have Planck's constant, we have the speed of light, the mass of the proton, the radius of the proton was precisely me measured later, but anyway, it's an important <coughs> number, the mass and, and extension of the universe, and we have also pure numbers, uh, you know, the fine structure constant, which I wrote is approximately that number, and the ratio of the uh, masses of proton and electron. So, how to continue there? Mm. One way is the development of physics, discovering all sorts of particles, up and down quarks and strange and bottom and top and so on and so on. And, uh, well, I don't think this makes sense. I think uh, if you look soberly at the methodology of physics, uh, particle physics, as practiced since 1930, is a futile enterprise in its entirety. It's not, it, it does not make sense to produce such, uh, so many unexplained numbers. And uh, I think if we really want to understand physics, we should remember also history. If the Lord Almighty had asked me before embarking creation, I should have recommended something simpler. Okay, he told this about uh, geocentric astronomy in the, in the Dark Ages, but I think it, it, uh, it's very to the point here. And of course also modern cosmology, I mean, you see a disagreement, you postulate dark matter. You see another disagreement, you postulate dark energy. You see another disagreement, you postulate realization and uh, initial temperature and this and that. Uh, cosmology has now 73 parameters, and I think this is the wrong way to go. Okay? Good physics is simple. We have historical evidence. If you want to make progress, we have to go back there. Even if it's uh, hard, to 1930 and ask uh, how, we, how we can go ahead. And I think there are some people who have achieved something in physics uh, who would agree numbers arbitrarily chosen by God do not exist and their alleged existence relies on our incomplete understanding. That was Albert Einstein in 1945. And Dirac, I mean, Dirac, he, he pondered for decades about the uh, mass ratio of, of electron and proton. That's what he really wanted to achieve in his lifetime. Okay? And he said, if, if you look at the a biography of, of Dirac, it says very clearly, and, well, I mean, physics in that uh, sense has become a very different enterprise from the science of uh, explaining the, the really the fundamentals of physics is, has become a high-tech sport which does not ask the fundamental questions any longer. And uh, Derek is also famous for an anecdote when, when uh, uh, once a, a, a young theorist uh, came to him and said, I have a new, Mr. Dirac, I have a new theory. So, can you explain the fine structure constant? No? So come again when you have calculated it. And I think, uh, well, this is uh, the historical point of view I'd like to take. And uh, I think it's just ignorance if you, if you don't realize this, that this is an open problem, like uh, calculating the fine structure constant. 
it is something to explain if you want to understand physics and of course explaining it by uh, postulating uh, other universes, parallel universes with others constants of uh, fine structure constants, that's not only ignorance, that's insanity. And uh, so I believe that the majority of modern physics is uh, based on ignorance, on the methodology and history of science. And uh, somehow we live in dark ages, but we have no choice. If, uh, if we want to take that seriously, that message of uh, understanding physics, we have to go back there and consider these constants. And by the way, I think that even this you might call this important constants of nature. But why nine constants? Why not less? Even these constants of nature cannot be really something fundamental. I think they have taken the role of gods. Constants of nature are believed to be the limits of our knowledge because our smartest people are unable to explain them. And they define it as the limit of our knowledge. But that might be an illusion. And I think um, fundamental constants have taken the gods of modernity, and this might sound very harsh, but either you're a rational person or you believe in constants of nature. I don't believe. Okay? So, and I would like to invite you, it's a very hard task and I cannot solve this, but I would like to, uh, how much can we achieve? And I would also tell you about, would like to tell you about two important steps that have already taken place. And here again, it's important that we are in Prague, and I think Prague is a very good place for this. Einstein, in 1911, his very first idea about general relativity was about explaining the deflection of light by variable speed of light. And so it's also the second uh, important uh, thing for Prague. And I mean, Jan wanted to uh, organize the conference in Finland, but I said, no, no way, we, we must stay to Prague. <laughs> uh, from, from the just proved assertion that the speed of light in a gravity field is a function of position, it's easily deduced from Huygens' principle that light rays propagating at right angles to the gravity field must experience curvature. And I think this is a vastly underestimated and very interesting idea by Einstein. And unfortunately, when he left Prague, going to Zurich, he met the wrong friends, mathematicians. They told him also another version, and uh, there were a, a a couple of unlucky coincidences, Einstein did a mathematical error and arrived at the half of the correct value. And so he took another way, instead of sticking to this idea, which I believe is the correct and even more, uh, more promising way to formulate general relativity. I don't have time today to go into detail uh, for everything. There is a book I will show you later. But I will just uh, present you some of the key ideas and, and the people uh, that are involved. There is, of course, Ernst Mach, who had the visionary idea of relating gravity to the presence of other masses in the universe. Einstein's visionary idea uh, relating the deflection to the, the presence of masses. And Erwin Schrödinger was, had in 1925 had a, a, an interesting paper about that. Uh, Dennis Sharma, without knowing about the other, depends, arrived independently at another formulation of this. And uh, Robert Dickey, maybe the most important contribution of all, he had a fantastic idea in 1957, correcting Einstein's error almost 50 years uh, earlier, and formulated a theory that could get rid of the gravitational constants. It's a very beautiful paper. He's uh, wondering about, uh, if, you, if you talk about optics, you wonder about um, uh, 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 refraction coefficient, and uh, Dicke calculated the necessary refraction coefficient uh, by the mass distribution of the universe. So 
Uh, this is uh, an, an extreme uh, uh, interesting formulation of, of general relativity, uh, which uh, explains the origin of, of the gravitational constants. I mean, of course, not many people have heard about, but that's the way to deal in a rational way with the problem of getting rid of of fundamental constants. And it beautifully verifies Mach's principle. Unfortunately, Einstein in 1911 had no chance to verify it because there was no cosmology at the time. The, the, the true size of the universe was discovered some 30 years later, I thought some 20 years later. So uh, this would be the Mach-Einstein-Dicke cosmology and just compare this. I, I think it's not misguided to compare it. Uh, here we have local gravity, okay, it's a constant of nature, Some, somebody understands it, so no, it's uh, all the same in the solar system, and then uh, again we have this local gravity in the solar system, so no, that is maybe related to the universe. I think this is a big accomplishment of Einstein and Dicke, and so we would have eight constants of nature left here, but there is even another uh, simplification which follows from that and maybe you've heard of uh, Dirac's hypothesis okay and these are coincidences like the one coincidence of of the speed of light with the electric constants and Dirac observed that there is an enormous number of the ratio of, of the electric and the gravitational force and there is another number of the same order of magnitude, which is the radius of the universe and the radius of the proton. Well, that's kind of strange. But, well, you might say, okay, coincidence. But there is another intriguing coincidence. The number of particles in the universe, or you might say the mass of the universe divided by the mass of the smallest structure of the proton, is just the square of the other number. And that sounds totally crazy, because, I mean, everybody would say, well, I mean, we have three dimensions here. I mean, the, the, the mass should somehow proportional to three dimensions, not to two dimensions, right? And there is a very interesting solution to this problem, because uh, I'm not going into details again, but Robert Dickey had the uh, ingenious idea of, uh, of relating um, this, uh, this variable speed of light to cosmology, saying that, okay, if, if uh, the presence of masses slow down the speed of light, then the increasing horizon continuously slows down during the cosmic evolution, the speed of light, and this causes the cosmic redshift. What, what Dicke does is explaining, he gives a real reason for the Hubble redshift which is an arbitrary construction in, in conventional cosmology. And if you follow this, uh, uh, this cosmology of variable scales, well, I skip this, it's, not, uh, it's also in here, you arrive at a very interesting conclusion. Uh, you have here the cosmic horizon, or, or I, sh I shall start with the absolute time, which is 10 to the 52 steps. But I give you a more accessible example here. So let's assume that from the Big Bang, or would call it by the Big Flash, we have 10,000 time steps. Then the cosmic horizon increases with the square root. The distance would be uh, 100 length steps. And uh, the speed of light then has to decrease. That's also what Robert Dickey calculated. It has to decrease with 1 over the speed of light the speed of light would uh, decrease to 100 of its, of its original value. And of course you have the equation C equals lambda and F relating the speed of light to the wavelength and frequency. That means if you have a decreasing speed of light, both wavelength and frequency has, have also to decrease. And as a consequence, you don't perceive the absolute time, you perceive the absolute time divided by the current time step which is 1,000, and you don't perceive the real horizon, but you perceive the horizon divided by the current length step, which is the wavelength. So in both cases, you arrive at a factor of 1,000, 
which gives you the illusion of a constant speed of light, by the way. And at the same time, you have the volume of the universe and the number of particles here, which is one million, which is the square of this perceived horizon. And that means Dirac's second hypothesis of the number of particles in the universe is explained by this cosmology. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not, not claiming that I solved all physics. I'm always uh, well, doubtful if I hear people claiming this. But uh, the first, the first uh, uh, Dirac's large number hypothesis is not explained. But the second, the second hypothesis can be explained by this uh, einstein dickey cosmology with variable scales. But we are still at seven fundamental constants. And now I'm going to talk about at a meta level, I mean, what could we possibly achieve? achieve. Um, if, you look, if you look at the remaining constants of nature, uh, you have two numbers. And I don't think many people have a good idea how to calculate these numbers. Uh, there is George Garmov claiming that might be related to the logarithm of the epoch, but that's speculation, okay? Honestly, there is no theory, but uh, as a matter of principle, such a theory is possible if you calculate numbers, okay? So let's suppose a very smart artificial intelligence uh, calculating 137 and the mass ratio of the proton and the electron, so we would, would arrive at five uh, constants of nature. And uh, there is another, once you have calculated the fine structure constant, then you, uh, you can rephrase Dirac's first coincidence, which looks very strange, relating the electric force to the size of the universe. This looks very strange. But once you have calculated the number 137, you can rephrase it in another very interesting coincidence, which, by the way, holds true to the current um, uh, measuring accuracy to the latest value. And it's H being related to this, uh, the speed of light, the mass of the proton, and the radius of the proton. And this is an intriguing coincidence. Because uh, well, in the standard model, people would argue, well, that's just arbitrary, that's random number. No, it's no coincidence that the proton, the only heavy stable particle in the universe, agrees with its, its uh, Compton wavelength, okay? That's the statement. And I don't think this is a coincidence. I think we should take seriously, and I'm glad that also other people would take it seriously, because there is an Einstein quote, the real laws of nature are much more restrictive than the ones we know. For instance, we would not violate our known laws, if we found electrons of any size or iron of any specific weight, nature, however, only realizes electrons of a particular size and iron of a very specific weight. I mean, he uh, spoke about electrons, of course, once you calculate the ratio, you can also put in protons. I think we have to take seriously this, this uh, ripples of nature. But let's remember, this is a coincidence. It's interesting but we have no theory for it, okay? Let's assume that when they transform into a theory, we would have reduced the number of fundamental constants to four, and, um, but there is still something left to explain. And now we're going to consider the, the, physical, the physical units. We have usually, we have left kilograms, meters, and seconds, but once you have understood that you can calculate the the gravitational constant, there is no need for kilograms because the Machian idea is mass is proportional to inverse accelerations. So there should be an intelligent way to express mass of a fundamental particle somehow to an inverse acceleration by phrased by the remaining constants of nature, which are the speed of light and the radius of the proton. Okay, this is not a theory, but it's just as a matter of principle something that still is missing if you want to do a fundamental progress. 
and that would be the complete realization of, of Marx's principle and uh, would, uh, would calculate Einstein's uh, constants as a, as a pure number. Yeah? The unit of kilogram would completely disappear and uh, that would make uh, the unit of, of H bar would, would become meters times second. But, uh, well, there are three constants left. And uh, I think now it, it becomes really hard because you can't get rid of, of C and H. You can argue, okay, the epoch is uh, the age of the universe somehow. Maybe you don't have to explain it. Uh, but uh, C and H are still remaining constants. And I do not mean you have to explain the numerical value. That's indeed irrelevant because it's a matter of definition, okay? And you can, but you have to explain the very existence. Why does nature present itself in such a peculiar fashion that it has a speed limit? And it has a limit of, of, in, of experiment in, in microscopy, okay? These are facts which need to be explained, and by the way, you cannot just sweep it under the rug, uh, setting them to unity. Uh, if you do fundamental physics, you have to explain the very existence, not the numerical value, but the very existence of these constants. And uh, if I go back to the methodology of physics, I'm thinking about Thomas Kuhn's uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, okay? We usually invent new constants when we have a problem, when the old paradigm is in a subtle way wrong and we gloss over it, postulating new constants. I mean, it's kind of strange saying that C and H are free parameters, uh, glossing over the real problems, but if we look at a large time scale of history, it might be just like that. Could C and H be anomalies? that indicate uh, what's before, before it's just Newton's Newtonian physics. And uh, what is Newtonian physics? It's just pure logic, you would assume. No, it's uh, the only things he did um, assume without justification is the concept of space and time. Could it be that the very concept of space and time is wrong in a subtle way? And C and H are anomalies that indicate precisely that failure. Because there is no reason whatsoever why matter should not be accelerated beyond the speed of light. I mean, it, it's just, if you take it seriously, it just falsifies Newton's laws. So the very existence of C, not the numerical value, the very existence of such a constant is a problem. On the large scale, and on the small scale, there is no reason for this continuous phenomenon. I mean, you could just uh, do calculations and uh, also the mathematics he developed together with Leibniz. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of strange that mathematicians, uh, they, they prove lots of theorems which are useful for physics, and with, if you go to the experiments, you say, oh, okay, on the, on the smallest case, you have to consider quantum effects, whatever that means. It could mean that the very existence of H is a failure of Newtonian physics and uh, a failure of space and time. Well, uh, it, it sounds kind of depressive, I know. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. Uh, space and time are certainly the concept that they're most easily accessible to human perception, but they may be inappropriate when it comes to describe reality on a fundamental level. I think we sh should take seriously that possibility. And, well, the question would arise, can space and time be replaced by more fundamental concepts? You're already shaking your heads, I notice. Can the existence of CH be deduced from purely mathematical properties? I think this is a worthwhile question to ponder about. And. However, however crazy, I mean, however you would like to shake your head, however crazy that would sound, um, remember, constants of nature are the gods of modernity. If we are rational people, I think there is no way out. We have to give a reason also for the existence of fundamental constants. 
And uh, I have some ideas, but I'm not going to present it right now. It's, it deals with mathematics of, of the three-dimensional sphere. And um, I hope that everybody disagrees now. So I go to uh, switch my, my topic and go to the methodology of physics. And I hope you uh, might agree a little bit more. Uh, I know this is a non-mainstream conference. And many of you would agree on uh, maybe a critique of, of, of the current standard models because they are obviously a little bit, well, uh, strange. But uh, unfortunately, we do not agree on the alternative, okay? I mean, I maybe I disagree with Jan on something or maybe, maybe Andre disagree with me on, on some topics, but that's okay. That's because we are independent thinkers, and um, once you belong to the thinking fraction, however, life becomes very difficult. Because if you don't just repeat what the majority or what the established uh, science says, you have to think to evaluate uh, evidence uh, with your own brain, and that's quite hard, okay? And it's, it's also okay if we are in error, if we make mistakes, because we have a much harder life in this sense. And I want to encourage you not to become depressed, uh, even if there's a, there's a small path. I mean, if your reasoning is based on wrong concepts, your lifelong efforts might be useless. Okay? But if you question everything, I mean, if I question that this is gravity, which drags me down, I mean, you're, you're, you will not achieve a new result in your lifetime either. So it's really the, the, a small line between the Greek beasts, Scylla and Charybdis we uh, shall take if we want to do reasonable physics. And how to do science today? Yeah? I mean, the idea of science is... Uh, that, that's, that's a recent, uh, very recent picture in Bonn. And, uh, and science is thinking without barriers. But all of you know that this is wishful thinking. So uh, we have barriers, we have big science, we have established opinions, we have a lot of parroting. And uh, I believe in evidence, and, uh, but what is evidence? Huh? And I would invite you to, to reflect about uh, what is considered evidence. I have a personal strategy to uh, distinguish between indubitable facts and fallacious evidence. And I think we have to, re I mean, once you see, once you realize that there is something wrong with the standard models, which is clear in my opinion, you have to reflect also about methodology and, and new standards of uh, scientific evidence. And I would say that Unsufficient evidence is publication in a scientific journal because we know every nonsense can be published in a scientific journal. Just think about string theory and supergravity and whatever. Uh, agreement of all experts is not a criterion because all geologists were uh, convinced that Alfred Wegener was wrong about continental drift. Yeah? Established within one research field is not a criterion either. If it's across many fields, that's another issue. Okay? But don't trust even large communities. People who know more than you think it's true, that's not... It's a face-based science, which is not science. And so many people would not deal with it if it was nonsense. I think that's the major reason for, for the existence of particle physics. And it's, it's not a good criterion, but because we might very well be on the wrong track. And, uh, yeah, I would like to encourage you. Uh, own perception, of course, but it's very limited. And uh, college-level experiments, that could be, I mean, it's hard to imagine that everything is wrong, which what is done in, in, in thousands of, of, of high school classes, okay? So let's trust about it, even if you haven't seen it. Uh, application in technology, I think, is a good criteria, because that's science that works. But all what works in science it has been invented before 1930, by the way. Uh, GPS, I mean, Ron Hatch might, might disagree with it, but GPS works, so somehow there is an effect of, of general relativity. 
uh, there are digital cameras, okay, the photoelectric effect, and there are cell phones, okay, I heard that before, so 89, uh, Maxwell's equations are verified by this conference. Uh, uh, open data is a very, I think it's maybe the most, most important criterion. Um, if you have access to the raw data, uh, without analyzing too much, uh, at a very basic level, that's, a, that's an indication of good science. And a, a project I particularly like, because I've done uh, analysis by myself, is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And uh, now compare these two uh, structures of, of science. I mean, uh, CERN has a vertical structure in the sense that there's a huge number of, of people, but there is one centralized um, analysis of the data. So everybody on every level is working better, and at the very end, okay, we, has, we have discovered the Higgs boson. But I don't think this the, such a vertical structure converging and, and uh, dismissing all, all uh, dissenting opinions makes sense. We need, uh, sorry, a horizontal structure. I think we need a vertical structure. And you need to go to every level, okay? Just go to the raw data. Go and analyze the pipeline of, of Sloan Digital Files coming. If you believe this, okay, go to the next level and say, I did by myself, I, I, saw, the, I saw the Hubble Redshift. Sorry, who doubts this? I had it on my computer. Okay? You can't go back here and say, okay, the, the error is in the pipeline, but just go there. Okay? Uh, evidence needs to transparency, and I think as a standard for modern big data and big science experience, we need this um, horizontal structure of data evaluation. Okay, uh, new criteria. Um, well, and I'd just like to encourage you again. This is uh, public access to raw data and analysis. And uh, by the way, uh, this spring I gave a talk at the German meeting of, uh, of physical societists, and I said, uh, I think that particle physics as practiced since 1930 is a futile enterprise in its entirety. And then there was a particle physicist in the audience that said, do you, do you tell this to your students? You're not supposed to. And I said, Yes, I do, because there are only two ways. Either you teach them to parrot, or you teach them to think. I didn't tell him to which group I think he believed, but that's, that's the way it works, okay? Uh, think by yourself, and I think again, we have uh, evidence from history that this makes sense. In the sciences, the authority of thousands is not worth as much as one tiny spark of reason in an individual. The intellectuals make ideologies out of their theories. Unfortunately, also in physics, many ideologies exist. Who does not follow the fashion easily drops out of the community members, which are taken seriously. Karl Popper, the philosopher I like very much. And then few are able to calmly pronounce opinions that descend from the prejudices of the environment. Most are even incapable even to reach such opinions. And Louis Victor de Broglie, if one had taken the ideas of these scientific geniuses who have been the promoters of modern science and submitted them to committees of specialists, there is no doubt that the latter would have viewed them as extravagant and would have discarded them for the very reason of their originality and profundity. Okay, some of my work you can uh, find here. The, the cosmological part is published a time ago in Annal de Physique. There is another paper on Wichere about Robert Dicke. And uh, then I have a popular book about physics, about uh, background physics. It's in English. That's a uh, translation of Vom Urknall zum Durchknall, which won the Science Book of the Year Award. And uh, this is the second book in German, and parts of that second book I decided to translate and to publish separately with some extensions as The Higgs Fake, How Particle Physicists Fooled the Nobel Committee. And, and this, is, uh, this is less critical, and 
this is an overview of well, the theory I, I worked through uh, too quickly. I think it, it really it's really interesting. It has it's really a great result that of Tiki. But uh, it, you know, I mean, people are giving talks, and once you sit there sometimes and say, okay, should I believe? Should I not believe? Okay, I'm not. You're not obliged to believe everything, but you you must acknowledge that there is a relation. Just take the papers; it's obvious there is a relation between Mark Einstein, 1907, Schrödinger, 1925, Dirac's large number hypothesis, uh, Denis Schama, and first of all Robert Dicke. And there is this obvious relation that people did not know about. I think this is a tragedy, and today we have the means to connect the the points together, uh, this is my message. Go to the history and verify, and this uh, needs to be considered. That's my overview. Thank you very much. Do you really think that uh, the uh, radius of our universe is a fundamental constant? No, 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 no. I mean, um, constant, I, I should have mentioned that. Constant not in a technical sense of not, not uh, variable, but a measuring value which is to be, to be explained. I mean, of course, uh, we live in a so-called expanding universe because light simply spreads and the, the horizon becomes bigger every day. Yeah? But the quantity is a measurable quantity which we should, should be able to relate to others. Yeah. Okay, thanks for clarifying this. Do you mind waiting for the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, from Newton, we knew that Newton calculated the weight of molecule and dimension of molecules from the uh, velocity of uh, sound in air, in air. So, uh, we believe that the <coughs> universe space is not empty, that there is um, matter or energy, and uh, that uh, also we believe that the particles is created from this uh, medium in space, and uh, so uh, the only possibility how we can measure this matter of this energy of the mass in space is in fact velocity. It's what? It's, it's velocity. And that is the velocity of light, C. Okay. So this is a connection. I showed in a few of my papers that in fact uh, when you divide <coughs> the Planck constant by velocity of light, it, you you can take it like a basic pressure of this medium of this ether, and then also for the Planck constant, for the parameters of proton, for instance the radius of proton and the mass of proton, as we show, is not coincidental. It's because if you take <coughs> the Planck constant divided by velocity of light is some basic pressure of the ether, of the medium in the universe. So it uh, logically from this follows that for proton, if you compress this medium, if you compress it to the dimension of proton, 10 to minus 15, you receive a mass, 10 to, uh, 10 to minus 27. That's all. So it is not coincidental with proton and uh, Planck constant and velocity level of light is connected that you must divide the Planck constant by the velocity of light. Thank you. So, well, I suppose that was more a comment than a question. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if, if, I, if I didn't get you wrong, you claim that you did that calculation already or you, you explained some of these concepts. I, I, I mean, um, well, I would be skeptical. I, I would say maybe I don't believe you, but I mean, at least you could be on the right track. Let's, let's say that. <laughs> Whereas the majority of physicists, it's, it's not. Uh, I don't believe, however, that uh, 
you, you, can, you can make smart models and you can, of course, do progress uh, with the other constants without attacking that very last issue of, of space and time. But once you come to the uh, constant C and H, it's a very fundamental problem of deducing uh, this very phenomenology of space and time, also explaining three plus one dimensions, explaining this very phenomenology from purely mathematical reasoning. Okay, so I th that's the framework. I'm not claiming I have explained this all this stuff, but that's that's uh, the way we could possibly uh, do progress, I think. Okay. Um, I wanted to, uh, actually, uh, by this presentation, I see that you kind of uh, have made uh, kind of progress uh, in terms of uh, not only righteously criticizing everything in physics uh, up from 1930s, but also going to some extent down beyond the old uh, Einstein and even reaching Newton, right? So, uh, there's kind of a good uh, progress on your side, you know, to not only look and criticize physics, physics yeah. up from the 1930s, right? Yeah, yeah. But to look down, yeah, yeah. to Kepler, to Arist even to Aristotle, and maybe Alexander and Aximian, if you yeah. want. Yeah. So, still, I see here some advancement compared to your books. They actually stay there, and uh, we have been waiting for new Einstein and Newton to save us, you know, and even kind of uh, not having good opinion of uh, so-called like uh, uh, people, people who who uh, what's the term, who criticize uh, relativity and so on. But still, you know, here uh, uh, you talk about uh, uh, gravity uh, constant g and kind of making it uh, obsolete, right? Absolute by uh, relating it to H and uh, and C. Uh, I think it would be better to look uh, more properly whether that G has been properly founded. Because if it is wrong, then C and in particular H as a constant should be wrong. And H is uh, debunked by 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 robot tail and and, 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 and crotters, you know, really as something just. Uh, Practical, uh, opportunity in terms of integrating uh, equations, things like that. You know, the, the integral stuff. So you know, I mean, uh, for that thing, I, 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 I salute what you have been doing in total, and some progress going downward below Einstein and Newton, and kind of provoking thoughts on that, and maybe some comment on, 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 on this, on this yeah. time, time on the constant, yeah. constant, and then making some absolute. What on, on what basis? Because th that, uh, that has been, been absolute is, is, uh, is kind of uh, well founded. If not, then these two are not well founded. You know, somehow you know that is kind of a two way, mm -hmm. two way road here. I think. Okay, okay. I, I hope I understood well. Um, well, uh, f f the first point is that uh, I think it, it's reasonable to look at the history of physics. But uh, history can be cruel. Uh, history was cruel to Otto Hahn, who missed the, split of the, the splitting of the nucleus for five years. It was cruel to, uh, to the discovery of oxygen. It was cruel to geologists with Alfred Wegener. And of course, history was cruel for 1,500 years to medieval astronomers. So we should be well advised to consider that possibility that history is also is cruel again for uh, some decades or even 100 years, and uh, and the second thing is I'm not it, it's not that I like criticizing in first place, but uh, necessarily if you look at the uh, at the history of physics, I mean you you just realize that it's it's very artificial. Uh, uh, the the accepted modern models and if you and there are so many unsolved questions which are open on the table for 100 years and you really you re really can't take that seriously that that modern kind of research and uh, I, I'm not finished maybe so so uh, I, th I think I think the cr I think the crucial. I 
I'm an idiot. Yeah. To, to accept these types of people, okay. or looking deeper. Yeah. I, I have to finish the first question before I go to the next one. Sorry, okay. but. That mainstream business would be somehow a risk to you. Okay. Okay. And putting that link, just the uh, time as it was a few years ago, up to that, everything was fine, and after that. <coughs> Okay. Okay. I need. I need to. I need to finish the first answer before I go to the second question. As as one constant of nature after another, and one question after another. That's the way it works. Uh, you need not to to agree. I think my uh, work, my consideration of of uh, the history is that more or less. Okay. Uh, physics has gone astray 100 years ago. There are people. On this side disagreeing, there are people on the other side disagreeing. That's okay. We also might agree to disagree. Okay, so thank you. We have 12 minutes break. Coffee break now. Thank you.